And so today is actually the third of our life question series uh, titled, Where Do I Come From? And to, to tackle this question, maybe, I, we, maybe many of us actually have not thought about this question before, right? So let me pose a question to you and I that you probably would, defi- okay, you would definitely have heard of before. The question is this, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Who has not heard this question before? Who has not? Oh, I've heard, right? Which came first, the chicken or the egg? And you know, there was a philosopher, some said egg, some said chicken. Oh, okay, I'm hearing murmurs. Okay, well, uh, it's, there was a philosopher that said in Washington University, he said that this question is a very charming question because for some of us, it might actually sound like a very stupid question. Lah. You know, why, why are we even thinking about this, right? But it is a, a question that ha- people have asked for thousands of years, and I'm not joking, thousands of years. And it's, it's such a f- fundamental question, I suppose, that Time Magazine, by the way, so this take, article was taken from Time Magazine in 2016, just a few years ago. It was so important that they had to cover it. And they quoted from the philosopher Plutarch. Uh, Plutarch lived in the 46 to 120 AD, and Plutarch was the one who put it in this, this, this phrase, right, this way. And Plutarch said this, whether the hen or the egg came first, it shook the great and weighty problem about whether the world had a beginning. Every generation asks this question because it reflects how we understand how this world came to be. Let me give you a few examples. Aristotle, which many of us heard of, philosopher, he said this, which came first? It doesn't matter. Because to him, the world was infinitely backward. Time just carried on and existed. So it doesn't matter whether chicken or egg came first. They both existed all the way. There are also some other worldviews that state that it also doesn't matter which came first because they see the world as cyclical. And actually, Pastor Rick spoke about a couple of that last week as well during Easter Sunday. It's cyclical. It doesn't matter which came first because they just go around in circles anyway. And then, there will be a school of thought, uh, especially for evolutionary science. They would say that the egg came first. It came first, right? And uh, how to explain this, there's a lot of things behind it, but astrophysicist deGrasse Tyson, you know, he's a forward thinker in astrophysics uh, and evolution, and he said in a very succinct way, the egg came first. And the egg was laid by a bird there was not a chicken. Because for them, two almost chickens, not exactly chickens, they came together and through some evolution, resulted in an egg which hatched the first modern understanding of what a chicken is. So for evolutionary science, the egg came first. Now, and, but frankly, frankly, most of us will probably not think about this question. I mean, no one thinks about this question on a day-by-day basis. We, we don't, right? We go about our normal day functioning as it is. Yeah, no one thinks about it. But this question perhaps falls into a kind of question, perhaps what we call, in, in big terms, existential questions. Questions like what Snoopy is thinking about here. What am I doing? Where am I going? What is the meaning of life? And the reality is that we will all think about these questions at one time or another in our life. Often when calamities hit, tragedy strikes, which causes us to think deeper as to why we are here. And I think that's why we have these life question series. And so today's question, uh, where do I come from, is one of these existential questions. But I will be first to tell you, okay? I'm going to be very clear and candid with everyone. Where where do I come from? The answer is, from a Christian perspective, God, right? And there are many ways we can look at it. And science has its own huge background here. And so, I'm being candid with you today to say that I'm not a scientist. I have not spent years researching on this. I'm not so familiar with all the schools of thought that I can put forth a very convincing and clear presentation. 
But what I can share with each, each of us this morning is the Christian worldview of why, where do I come from? And I'm going to share this and hope that when I share this as to why then it makes sense for me as to why I have hope from here, for those of us who are not yet believers in Christ, I hope this spurs you to thinking as to where you came from. And I hope this helps you as in your search for meaning in this world. And my second purpose is that for those who are Christians already and believers in Christ, I hope that as we go through these pointers also, it helps establish your own understanding of creation, understanding of where you came from and even who you are. So let's begin by committing this time to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Almighty God, first of all, we acknowledge that we will never be able to fully understand who you are or even the things in this world. They are just too f- magnificent, too big for our finite minds to comprehend. And if you even did do it, share everything you knew and who you are with us, Lord, we will be so overwhelmed, we wouldn't know what to do. And so in this next half an hour or so, Father, we commit ourselves to you asking, Lord, you just help us open our minds and our hearts. Speak to us, dear Lord. Help us know you better. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So you'll see in the outline today, I have two questions that kind of hopefully will help us understand where do I come from. Two further questions. The first question is this. What do we learn about creation from the Christian point of view? Right? Uh, now, this question is so big. It is so big that there are organizations just dedicated to answering this question. We spend their entire time and effort and money and resources helping people understand and explain this and figure it out. Right? So I definitely cannot do it justice. But the next few points I will raise perhaps, hopefully, helps you understand creation from the Christian perspective. So the first thing I want to raise up is that God comes first. Uh, yeah, I, I know it sounds really obvious and elementary, but I do need to raise it up because this is perhaps the most distinguishing feature of how Christianity views creation and the origin of the world. Um, now, even amongst Christians, amongst Christians, I agree also, and I see that there are differing views on which came first, chicken or egg, even among Christians, right? But all Christians would still agree on the one fundamental basis of creation, in that God comes first. It means that before universe, before time even began, before even we could consider space as a whole, God comes first. Trust me, not every worldview sees that. Let me give you an example to illustrate this. In Exodus chapter 3, in this story of how God met Moses in the burning bush, how God introduced himself, even the way he introduced himself to Moses, showcases an illustration for him and for us what God means by saying that he comes first. In the beginning, God. In Exodus chapter 3, we see that Moses was met by God, encountered by God in a burning bush, And the Bible tells us, and the bush, while in flames, was not consumed. Meaning, the flames did not require the tree to give its source for fuel. It just is. And the illustration showcases that God himself, in his presentation to Moses in this particular form, was self-sustaining. He was self-sufficient. He, as the flame, did not need something to fuel him or to give him energy to exist. That was the way that God explained himself to Moses. And then we hear the famous phrase, God said to Moses, I am who I am. So God comes first. He is infinitely perfect, infinitely powerful, all-sufficient. And back in those days in the Bible, remember this. Remember in the days of the Bible, there were other worldviews and religions where the gods required the prayers of people, for example, to fuel them, to give them 
life itself. But the Christian worldview says that, no, God doesn't need that. He's all-powerful, all-self-sufficient. And that's actually why then, because when you talk about creation, right, we ask about who came first, right, chicken or egg, and we ask about, you know, what I'm saying is this, there's a famous meme that we always see. If God created everything, then who created God? Right? We, we, we will see that meme all the time. Even children ask that thing because they will sting the link the dots. You say God created all the trees created by God, then who created God? But precisely because the Christian worldview states that God is infinite and that His creation, John Edwards says, is not of His need, but of His perfect fullness. It's an overflow in that sense. It ends with God. If you talk about if God created everything, it would only make sense if what was created is finite and has limits. And many, for many worldviews, that created that very start of life itself has a limit. And that's why you need to ask who created that. Evolution's theory would say that Darwin said that life began from a single cell organism. Richard Dawkins, a still surviving um, scientist, he said that life began on Earth from a self replicating molecule. And because it's limited, you wouldn't have to ask this. What created that? But when we say that God comes first and He is self-sufficient, there's nothing before Him, it kind of ends this question. Because we will never understand and there's no logic to answering that because then it becomes an infinite regress of causes because then this question will have no end. It ends when we recognize that God comes first. Second thing we understand about creation is that God created all things from nothing. Ex nihili hilo, Latin for from nothing. Genesis 1.1, God created the heavens and the earth. And this is a way of writing that states that everything from heaven to earth, from the book end of heaven and earth, in between, God created everything, and the Bible tells us, created everything from nothing by the power of of his word, the spoken word, Genesis 1, 3. And then what this means for us, when I look at this, I then understand that if God created everything from nothing, it means that he is, therefore, the grand designer of all things. It means that he has the blueprints for how everything here on this world works. And he's the only one, the one being who understands it all. This is very different from, once again, other worldviews. Um, let me start perhaps with a philosophy that some of us might be familiar with. I know this fiction, but Star Wars, for example. In Star Wars, um, there is one force, but in this one force, there are two opposing forces, the dark and the light. And it states that in the world, therefore, these two forces are constantly in, well, maybe some say battle, but constantly con coming together, and that in us, then, is the dark and the light. And by the way, you might say Star Wars fiction, but I would then say that a common philosophy that we would understand, especially as Chinese, would be yin and yang. Yin and yang is a Chinese cosmological concept that there is a light and a dark, two forces. Since the, and it states that since the start of the world, these two forces have been in constant Opposite but constant, well, not say battle, lah, constant communion connection and this constantness, the world is created. And that's why in this constant tussle between yin and yang, each of us then has a concept of yin and yang inside us. Right? And not just us, but even the world as it is. Two battling forces. But what I'm saying is this, if God created all things from nothing, there is no battle of two forces. It's just one. God, just God. Some might say, what about evil? Well, if you look in the Bible, evil came after. Evil didn't, wasn't there from the very beginning, but there are worldviews that state that there are two forces. Here, God is one, the author of all things. Thirdly, creation as we know it is linear. The Christian worldview says that creation as we know it is linear. There's a beginning, and the end, Revelation, I'm the Alpha, the Omega, first and last, 
beginning and the end. So God doesn't just tell us how the world began. He also tells us at the very start, not necessarily how it ends, but more importantly, that he will be there and he is there at the end. And this is meaningful for me because then it tells me that this creation that we have will come to an end point and God is there. It will come to an end point where there will be judgment, but there will also be salvation. That this created order as we know it is not just going around in circles, in cycles. Let me illustrate. Um, there are quite a few famous movies where this main character is caught in a time loop. For example, the most famous of them being Groundhog Day. In this movie, in these movies, quite a few of them, you will notice that the main character is caught in a time loop where this character lives day after day after day in the same cycle. And these kind of movies actually, right, they are just a small subset of the whole idea of life being cyclical. And you can see in these movies, the main character in, in that time loop, a lot of them go through this journey where after a while, they lose hope. And they wonder, why am I just going through this again and again and again and again and again and again? And, again? and they start to lose hope because it just gets monotonous and they wonder why and, and, and all. And a lot of these movies then, the purpose of the movie is to break that cycle so that time becomes linear again. To me, this gives me hope because it means that what I'm doing now matters. An extension of what Pastor Rick said, because there will be an end point where judgment, where salvation will occur. And I'm then accountable for what I'm doing now. Because if it's cyclical, then why bother? We're just going to come back again and again and again. Which then leads to this fourth point. God is alpha, omega, beginning, end, which also then means that God is both source and sustainer of everything. It means that now, while we are in this point between start and end, God sustains everything here. Acts chapter 17, 28. In God, we live and move and have our being. Hebrews 1, He upholds the universe by the word of His power. And because God sustains everything, it then reminds me that I'm accountable to Him because He controls and holds everything in the palm of His hand. It means that What I do here matters because God is overseeing everything and He knows what we are doing. Lastly, we then understand that people, we, we are the apex of God's creative work. It is highly important because in some, view, in some worldviews, man is but a creature, an evoluted creature, evolution creature where we just are. We are not different, perhaps, from the creatures around us, just more advanced, perhaps. But the Bible says that God created man, us, each of us, in his own image, male and female. He created them. It means that us as people are different and special, and there is meaning in it. Hebrews 1.3, the fact that God created us from the dust, oh, sorry, the uh, this is wrongly referenced, Genesis 2.7, sorry. Uh. The second is Genesis 2.7, not Hebrews 1.3. But it says here that God formed man from dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. God breathed, rock, wind, the spirit coming into us. And then that means that we are now different and separate from the created order. And Genesis, after God created man, he said that it was all very good. Distinguishing man itself from everyone, every other created being in order. So these are just the five things that we can understand about creation itself from the Christian point of view. The other question then I perhaps pose to us is, what does creation teach us about God himself as God? Same thing, this question is huge and I'm, I'm just going to raise three points that hopefully would help us understand it better. But you, by all means, please go and search and figure this out more as you journey as well. 
But first of all, it teaches me then that creation reveals a God of order and beauty, that there is precision and beauty in this created world that God has established and created with the word, with the power of his word, both in the big and the small. Now, I'm going to quote from a couple of people because, once again, I'm no scientist. But let me first quote from Dr. Paul Brand. Dr. Paul Brand is um, a doctor who, whose work revolutionized how leprosy was treated. So for him, going into the, the micro, the small, the human body was important for him. And he, the more he examined the human body, that's why he said this. This is why I said, the more him, I delve into natural laws, the interplay of all mechanisms to sustain life, the, I mean, the more how he sees all these things and how he could su support life, he says he's astounded that the whole creation could collapse like a deck of cards if just one of these factors were removed. He's saying that in his looking at the small, everything that he sees around him, if it were just misplaced by a little bit, by an iota, everything would collapse and fall through. The only reason we can exist as human beings here in the micro, in, in, in our bodies, because everything fits together perfectly. And when something is off, that's why you start to see decay and breakdown, and etc., etc. That's the micro. What about the, the macro, the macro? Well, let me give you an example. Um, we're all sitting still here, right? At least we feel that we are now sitting and we're not moving. But have you considered that we're not moving now, sitting here, only because there's an interaction of physics and forces that allow us to sit still? Okay? Why I say this, huh? why? We know that the earth turns on its axis like this, right? How do we know this? That's why we have our 24-hour days. Correct? In 24 hours, the, the earth turns around on its axis like this, constantly turning. But do you know when the earth turns around like this, it's moving at a speed of 1,609 kilometers per hour daily. We are staying still, but actually the earth is moving consistently in this way that fast every day. And we also know that the earth is also rotating around the sun. So it's just going like that, but it's also going around the sun and going on the sun is going at the speed of 108,000 kilometers per hour, constantly moving. And it's the interaction of these forces and, and multiple others that I don't understand, <laughs> moving on the sun, moving on the axis, that therefore we can actually stay still. If any of these forces were to shift by a little bit, you end up us flying or jumping or leaping or not being able to just sit still. That's how exact and a God of order, God is. And creation shows us that. But God is also a God of beauty. In 1968, Christmas Eve, Apollo 8, Apollo 8 was the first manned spacecraft in space past the Earth's atmosphere. Apollo 8 went out into the atmosphere on Christmas Eve, 1968. Apollo 8 came out from the dark side of the moon, and for the first time in human recorded history, man saw the earth in its macro form. Apollo 8 saw this picture. Christmas Eve, 1968. You see the earth in all its glory, picture against the dark black of space. First time anyone ever saw this large picture of earth. And the three astronauts, scientists themselves, when they saw this, what they said was aired in, tele uh, in radio at the time. The whole world was listening. And what they uttered in the beginning, God heard over national radio because that was the only response that they could have. And this, by the way, is a commemorative stamp that was made to celebrate Apollo 8. Creation reveals a God who is of order and of beauty. But creation then, also from that macro perspective, reveals a God who is above us. 
and I'll use the, the, the word here, transcendent, meaning that creation shows us a God that is so big beyond our comprehension. Pastor Steve, the way put this so nicely, he said, the universe is big. Why? It says something to us about the God who made it. He is bigger. And dear friends, I, I don't know about you, but I need a God who is bigger. When I look at the world around me and I see its calamity, its chaos, if we were to depend purely on the abilities and the moral code of man, what I'm seeing is a world that is, pardon my language in this, digging its own grave. For every person who comes up to say, I'm going to try my best to save the world and solve world, solve world hunger and bring world peace, what I see is just something worse and worse. And when I consider the reality, at least the Christian reality, that there is a God who is bigger, when I tell my children to pray to God and I tell them that God is sovereignly in control even though we don't understand it, a God who is above us, that's where I place my hope, a God who is beginning and end, who holds everything in, con in control. That is hope for me. And that's what leads the psalmist in Psalm 8 verse 1. This explains this transcendence, this above us. Oh Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. Psalm 8 is a psalm that people talk about that describes creation because the psalmist understands that God is above us, higher than the heavens. But creation, and we know that, creation makes us feel small and rightly so. But Psalm 8 is a lovely psalm because it not only talks about the largeness, the transcendence, the above us power of God. Read on. In Psalm 8 verse 3, the psalmist continues, when I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars you set in place, he still sees the transcendence, the largeness of the universe. Verse 4, what are mere mortals that you should think about them? Human beings that you care for them. The transcendent God who is above us, we are mere mortals, but made in God's image, the apex of creation, but God still cares for us. So creation not just shows us that God is above us, transcendent, at the same time, beyond our understanding perhaps, because many other worldviews say that God is so distant, so far, He's nowhere near us, creation then shows that God is also caring and personal. Creation also reveals a God who is personal, His imminence. His transcendence is seen in creation, but also His imminence, where God is personal with us. Imminence, the, the root word of imminence comes forth the word that we, we know well at Christmas, Emmanuel, God with us. Romans 1.20 says, for his invisible attributes, his eternal power, divine nature, let me clearly perceive ever since the creation of the world, the things that have been made. God fashioned a world and he didn't just leave it to run on its own, like self-sustaining. In fact, he, well, he created a world and he's personally invested in everyone, in all of us. And through his investment and through creation, he desires to speak and to connect with us. A pastor said that all creation preaches forth God's glory. Another pastor said, creation helps us understand abstract terms about God in concrete, visible ways. Creation helps us see the, abst the abstract realities of who God is in concrete, visible ways. What do I mean? World Vision in 2010 did a study of how children get to understand and become aware of God. And these are not children who are Christians. These are just children that they look after in their ministry. And they ask, I was reading an article and one, one thing popped up here. This boy from Uganda, 10-year-old, uh, no, 7-year-old boy said, I know there is a God because of the rain. 
And he said, because who can fetch so much water, go to the sky, and pour on the earth? Now, yes, you can say, sure, this boy is a seven-year-old boy, you know, doesn't understand this water cycle and all that. Sure, fair enough. But what I'm saying is this, creation was what led him to understand and internalize that there is a God. Because God, creation reveals a God who is personal, who wants to make himself known to us. John Stott said this, the Bible isn't about people trying to discover God, but God, about God reaching out to find us. God in his creation, specifically in creating us people, he created us to know him, to love him, and to display his glory to others. Jeremiah 1.5 before I, meaning God, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. And I'm touched by this. Which other worldview tells you that God knows you? And the word know here is translated as an intimate knowledge. Not just your name. So, to put it all together, I know it's been heavy, heavy, so thank you for following with me. In one slide, where do I come from? Two questions I propose. What do we learn about creation from the Christian point of view? That God comes first. He is self-sustaining, self-sufficient. God created all things from nothing. Therefore, He is a desi grand designer, intelligent designer of all things. Creation as we know it then is linear. There is a beginning and end, and He is there, which means that there is, will be an end where you will see salvation and judgment at the same time. God is both source and sustainer of everything, which to me then means that I'm accountable to a God who is sovereignly in control of all my life. People, I am, I'm different from the created order because I'm the apex. We are the apex of God's creative work. What does creation teach us about God Himself? That God is God of order and precision, but also of beauty, for this world, for us to admire and re respond because through His created beauty, we can see who God is for He is both above all and yet personal at the same time. But this is still, in, to some extent, perhaps in our minds. Some of these existential questions, they often reflect a deeper need. Last week, when Pastor Rick spoke about um, what happens when we die, why, why do we need to know what happens when we die? When we know what happens when we die, that often influences, changes drastically the way we live now, doesn't it? Because when you know when you die, it means that it, you will then adjust the way you live. It gives you some sense of purpose and direction. Because if you know that there's nothing at the end, why bother to live well? Today is the other way around. Why do I need to know where I come from? What am I actually asking? What am I searching for actually when I, found, when I want to find out about where I came from? And I want to propose to us that a deeper question, deeper than where do I come from, the need that it surfaces within us is this question. Where do I belong? Or to whom do I belong? Three weeks ago, I preached on the pulpit as well that developmental psychologists recognize that when a child imitates his parent or his or her parent, it's not just for learning. And rather, what he or she wants to learn from imitating is to fulfill a sense of belonging. And that's why a child imitates his or her parent. That's why also why God in Scripture tells us, imitate me for I am your father. We want to find out about where we came from because we want to know where we belong to. It is known to many of us that adopted children, adopted children, many of them, many of them want to find out where they came from. Read articles and stories that they will always go on a search and ask 
their parents. Where are my biological parents? Can I find them? And they did search. Majority of adopted children go through that. Why? Well, one of the largest adoption agencies in the US and communities, they came up with five reasons. Five key reasons after doing a study and they realized that only one of them, frankly, is functional. That one that's functional is to find out medical history. Why? Because we will know, for those of us who are senior, we will know medical history, so we know what we might be suffering from now. But the other four reasons they found out were not functional. One of them is the child is curious. And by the way, this child is not just young children. Even adult children are sometimes looking for who are my real parents? Where do I belong? Curious? I'm just curious to know what were the circumstances that led to me being adopted out. Or some said that, well, I'm trying to find a bond, perhaps. That's the other reason, with my real parents. Or some said that I want to find out where I came from so that it gives me some form of meaning, helps me know who I am. Because we want to try to find out where we came from, maybe that would shape who I am, part of identity. Some said that it's to fill a void within because they, they have this void and they realize that it, it's an emptiness that they find that they cannot resolve until they find out who their adopted parents are. And I relate to that. <sighs> Three weeks ago, Two weeks ago, I lost my biological father. For some of you who don't know, um, my biological father committed adultery and they divorced when I was six. Not much contact over the years. Part of me still very angry at what he did. Didn't really want to connect with him very much. Over the years, yes, there was some minor contact, I suppose, but just didn't want to. Three years ago, I found out that he passed away. It was a confusing time. I wasn't sure why I was confused, frankly. I mean, I was thinking to myself, this is a man who left me my mom alone. Why am I feeling like this? Why do I even need to go for the wake or the funeral? But I went. And when I went in, my, my biological father had a big family. And when I went in, everyone who saw me stood up and they recognized who I was. Because when I looked in their faces, I realized that I looked like them. It was the first time in my life, it was a strange feeling because I went to a place where I knew I biologically belonged, but I didn't know any one of them. I come from? I came from a family which was broken. And even then, when I went into an environment where I knew I was supposed to belong, I yet didn't feel belong because they had no relationship with any one of them there. saying to us for who are listening maybe that's the reason you're asking for yourself where I come from because the deeper need is a need of belonging it's a need to know who we belong to and the security in knowing that I'm in a place where I'm loved I'm looked after 
despite the craziness of this world. Is that the question that some of you are be asking today? Or are some of you having that feeling of confusion where I, I don't know where I belong? And even though I, I know that I come from my family, it, and I'm sharing with you this morning, you know where you belong? You belong to the Father who created you, who knows you. You belong to the Father who despite our sin and our rebellion, our tearing away from Him, gave His Son so that you might come back to Him, so that you might not have this feeling of tension of I belong yet, I don't belong because He wants you to know that you are His and you belong to Him. heard a thousand stories of what they think you like but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night I've seen many searching for answers but we're searching for answers only you can provide because the Father who created us and loved us and gave His Son for us so that we might come back to Him knows what we need before we can say a word.
So for those of us, I ask that we just bow our heads right now. For those of us who are asking ourselves, where do I come from? Or those of us who ask ourselves, Lord, where do I belong? Some of us might have come from families which are far from perfect, broken, unsafe, and we don't feel ourselves or at home in our families even. It's messy. I'm saying to you, I'm saying to me, yes, it's messy. Yes, it will not just go away like that, stem of a finger. But I'm saying to us that we have hope because we have a Father who is perfect, who created us, who knows us inside out, who knew us from when we were in our mother's womb. A perfect Father who understands the tension and the turmoil and the confusion that we might have inside of us. We have a Father who will restore because there will be an end when justice and salvation and mercy and perfection and restoration will be poured forth where there are no more tears and all will come into this perfect relationship with Him. And because of that reality, knowing that we cannot save ourselves, God sent His Son, a love so undeniable, unfathomable, a peace so unexplainable, a shalom, a safety, a security that transcends understanding because He is transcendent, yet so imminent and close with us that He says to you and I, you are the apex of my creation and I love you. And I love you. Come to me. Acknowledge that you cannot do it because we can't. But I can. For I sustain this whole world in the palm of my hand. And through its darkness, there will be a day when I will prevail. For I was there at the beginning and it's me. The perfect so undeniable You're a good, good father, Lord. in all of 
this morning. We're going to spend some time closing this service in times of ministry and our prayer. I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to close the benediction to close the service. But I'm also going to ask and pray for us. And if you require prayer, reconciliation, prayers of restoration, prayers of healing, prayers of repentance, I invite you to come forward and we will be here to pray with you this, this day. A perfect, our perfect Father in all His ways wants to minister and love and draw you back to Himself. And so when I close the benediction, I then ask that for some of us, you may leave the hall, but I ask that you leave quietly. I ask that you leave quietly so that some who require time of prayer and ministry can come forward. I ask that you continue your fellowship downstairs. Or may we have this space as a time for coming before our loving, perfect, infinite, glorious, amazing Father. And so Father, I thank you Lord for your glory. I thank you for being so far above, beyond what we can ever imagine because we need that kind of big God. But I thank you too, God, that you are a God who is so personal within each of us for you know us and you are journeying with us now even when we don't realize it ourselves. And Lord, for us who are searching for answers, Lord, God has the courage to come to you to have those answers resolved. Build in our hearts faith and a peace and a shalom to know that you are loving and you have every, all entire life in control in the palm of your hand. If we walk in your ways, help us understand that, dear Lord. Fulfill it in our lives. Break us so we can come to you. So once again, I'm going to give the benediction and I ask, the music will carry on playing, but I ask that for those who require ministry, please come to the front. We are here to journey with you. And for those of us who need to go, I ask that you leave quietly, having space here in this sanctuary. The benediction from 1 Thessalonians, now may the God of peace Himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ but before he, for He is the Alpha and Omega and He who calls you is faithful and He will surely do it. Amen. So once again, for those who are leaving, it's the end of this morning service but please leave quietly. For those who require prayer, please come forward. We want to be here to pray with you. Please come forward. The elders, the pastoral staff will be here. As you leave, I pray that you continue fellowship downstairs. Praise the Lord. May the Lord be with you this week.